everyone, and welcome back to Tea Time Thoughts. I'm Kaylin, as always, and today I first want to give a shout out to my good friend Quinn Clarkson for designing our new album cover for this podcast. I absolutely love it, and she's just incredibly talented, and she's going to be opening an Etsy shop soon, and once that's available, I will let you guys know the name, so that way if you're interested in her designing something for you, you can have her do so. So today, as I drink my honey vanilla chamomile, I wanted to talk about Lady Jane Grey, also famously known as England's nine-day queen. So if you don't know about Jane Grey or her story, to make it all short, Edward VI of England made Lady Jane Grey his heir and blocked off his sisters Mary and Elizabeth from the throne in order to preserve Protestantism in the country. However, shortly after Jane was claimed queen, Mary gathered support and displaced Jane and eventually executed her to eliminate the threat to her position. Obviously, I'm not going to end it there. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So now that you have the basic idea of how the story goes, I'm going to go ahead and give you some more of the details on how this all actually came to be and why Jane ended up in the position that eventually got her killed. So, in 1543, King Henry VIII of England issued a proclamation of an act of succession, which effectively legitimized his two daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, into the line of succession for the English crown after his son Edward. So then, if anything were to happen to Edward or any of the children that he might have, that they would come to power. And when Henry VIII died in 1547, his son Edward VI came to rule, but he was only nine years old at the time of his father's death. So when he first went into office as king, he had a lot of help and assistance from people that were working to control his power until he came of age. And he was a very devout Protestant, and he was very determined to maintain Protestantism in England. And some of the most extreme measures that we actually see during somewhat of the Protestant Reformation movement in England with destroying stained glass windows and plastering over painted walls and ceilings. We usually associate that with Henry VIII, but a lot of this actually took place while Edward was on the throne because he was a lot more devoutly Protestant than his father. Even though Henry VIII is the one that kind of put into motion the Church of England, he had grown up with the Catholic faith and he was somebody who was also very religious too. It was actually said that that when Henry VIII had died, he died clutching a Catholic rosary in his hands. So Edward was the one that was really pushing for this movement to be solidified in England because it would be so easy for whoever was next as king to just sort of dismantle whatever his father had put into motion and make peace with the Pope and bring back Catholicism. But Edward wanted to make sure that nothing of the sort happened. So Edward would only reign for about six years and he would die around the age of 15 due to illness. So when Edward started to show signs of illness, he drafted his line of succession, and he knew his sister Mary would be a big threat to his goals for Protestantism. Mary was a very stoutly Catholic woman, and it was said that when she refused to stop holding Mass, that Edward went in to demand that she obey him as her king, and adheres to the Protestant religion. Apparently, the argument that the two of them had had been so abrupt and heated that they both left in tears. So as much as I'm sure he would have liked to simply let his sister rule, he had ultimately decided to change the succession to a Protestant heir. He just couldn't give the throne to his sister Mary for that particular reason. And he also couldn't give the throne to his other sister who would become Elizabeth I. Even though Elizabeth was in the line of succession, in order to make Elizabeth the heir to the throne, he would also have to recognize Mary's claim as well. So the only way to get around that was to ultimately have them both declared illegitimate. So therefore, Elizabeth wasn't an option for him. So instead, he turned to the House of Grey, and this is where Jane comes in. 
First of all, Jane was related to Henry VIII through her grandmother, Mary, who was one of Henry VIII's younger sisters. And she was also related through her mother, Lady Frances Brandon, who was a great granddaughter of Henry VII, who was Henry VIII's father. And at first, he wanted to declare Jane Grey's male heirs as his successors. But Jane was still very young, and despite being married to Guilford Dudley at around the age of 15, she didn't have any children, let alone any male heirs. Edward and Jane were actually about the same age. So Edward eventually couldn't afford to wait for Jane to have children. His illness was worsening and it's actually likely that he died of tuberculosis. So one of his last measures as king was to eventually change his succession with a slight note in his document. You can see on the succession act that he's writing, he goes back and scrapes out part of it and changes the document from saying Lady Jane's heirs male to Lady Jane and her heirs male. He then died on July 6, 1553. The thing is, Edward's death was actually not announced until July 9th. They were trying to keep the information under wraps as much as they could, because if you can control that information, you're successfully maintaining some kind of power, because once the information of the king's death gets out, an absolute frenzy is going to break loose over who gets the crown next. So by July 9th to July 10th, that's when the news was finally broken to Jane that she would be queen. And apparently Jane was so shocked when she heard the news that she actually fainted. She had never grown up expecting to be queen. She never had any desire really to be queen either. So why was Jane the one that Edward picked out of all the people? This mainly had to do with Jane's devout belief in Protestantism. We tend to paint Jane as somewhat of a naive girl who could never really hold her own. We really, you know, associate Jane's age with part of her downfall. We kind of imagine her to be this young girl that was in over her head, or we imagine her to be a simple pawn in between these different players trying to vie for power. And these are some things that we do have to take into consideration, but one one thing we kind of forget is that Jane was also a very well-educated Tudor woman and we know how strong and powerful Mary Tudor and Elizabeth Tudor were but we don't always extend that kind of similar grace to Jane. She would have had a very similar education to her cousins and it was said that she could hold a debate and a discussion well. And one thing that the movie about Jane Grey with Helena Bonham Carter does very well, when we first kind of meet her character, she's debating with a priest over the logistics between Protestantism and Catholicism. She demonstrates her Protestant beliefs in this, but she also shows to make very valid and educated points. She's not just simply throwing something at the wall because she believes in it. And it's also possible, too, that because Edward and Elizabeth were so close in age that they may have had the chance to form some sort of friendship, at least before Edward took the throne and mainly spent his time surrounded by his advisors. Back when he had some form of a childhood, it's possible that he and Jane may have been friends. And at one point, it was even suggested by Thomas Seymour that Edward and Jane should marry. However, eventually when Jane learned that she would be queen, she accepted, but she said that she accepted with great reluctance. And the next day, she was declared Queen of England, France, and Ireland, and moved with her advisors to the Tower of London. Now, we immediately think of the Tower as a prison because... For a lot of people it was, but it was also a fortress and it held a great deal of the state's weaponry, and it was also the most intimidating building around London at the time. When we look at the Tower of London today now, it's kind of drowned out by a lot of the skyscrapers around the London city, but if we think at the time, London, though it was a city at the time, it was surrounded by a lot shorter buildings. You'd be able to see the Tower of London from miles around. It was something that was significantly tall and therefore was very imposing. And it's also the custom for monarchs to reside in the tower while they're awaiting their coronation. One of history's great ironies is that Anne Boleyn stayed in the same room for both her coronation and while she was awaiting her execution. A great deal of Jane's rise to power was ultimately orchestrated by her father-in-law, the Duke of Northumberland, and he's going to be a very key player throughout a lot of this. 
and he was also invested with the notion of gaining power for himself and power for his son. But ultimately, he was disappointed to find out that Jane was adamant that her husband Guilford would not be named king. The highest position she would offer him would be as the Duke of Clarence. And again, this shows us the strong Tudor woman roots. They expected her to be a pawn, and I'm sure in some ways she was used as that, but she was showing her strength where she could. Northumberland's main focus, though I'm sure given the time he would have probably liked to go and fight against that point more, his main focus was to find and capture Mary Tudor, Edward's oldest sister, and to gain support of the people. So the Privy Council had pledged their support to Jane, and so Northumberland went himself to capture Mary with his band of troops. And originally, they had intended to send Jane's father out, but... Jane's father was really more of a political man. He didn't have necessarily a lot of army or military experience. So Jane eventually pled for her father not to go and it was decided that Northumberland would go instead. However, this is where things begin to go wrong. Originally, they thought it would be somewhat of an easy task to find Mary, but Mary, as soon as she caught wind of Edward's death, she fled immediately to evade capture, and she instead took refuge in East Anglia. She had a lot of estates out there and was familiar with the territory. She pled with a lot of the people to support her, and a lot of the people, whether they were Catholic or simply felt that she should be queen due to succession, due to the fact that it made sense to them, they ended up pledging their support to her. What's so fascinating is not only are they pledging her support politically, but so many of them are pledging support physically. They're marching with her to defend her. These aren't necessarily trained soldiers. Some of them are farmers carrying pitchforks or people that are carrying their grandfather's armor along with them. But nevertheless, it's support that ultimately is going to make a huge difference. Once Mary gains the support, the Privy Council decides that they have to change their allegiance to Mary. Northumberland is facing obvious defeat through Mary's growing support. So once he catches wind of the fact that the Privy Council has changed their minds, he surrenders to Mary and tries to pledge allegiance to her as well. Even Jane's father tries to kind of switch at this point. And so Jane is eventually left with no choice but to give up the crown, and her father had been the one to tell her of the defeat, and Jane was very quick to give it up. It didn't take much persuasion on her part, but one of the most heartbreaking things that not only shows us Jane's youth, but also shows us how much she didn't want this, is she turns to her father and asks, do I get to go home now? This is heartbreaking because Jane would never be allowed to leave the tower. She, her husband, her father, two of her brothers-in-law, and her father-in-law, Northumberland, would be arrested, and Northumberland would actually be executed a month later. So Jane faced a trial and ultimately pled guilty to a charge of high treason. This would be basically an indisputable charge because she had already signed documents as Jane the Queen and because this would be infringing upon the powers that Mary had as Queen, she would be sentenced to death. And the sentence officially said to be burned at the tower or to have her head cut off at the Queen's pleasure. And this is actually because burning was typically the punishment for a woman who had committed treason. It, in a way, it was considered to be a quote-unquote bloodless execution, which we know is kind of a joke. I think a lot of us would so much rather face a quick beheading than have to be burned to death. Mary would ultimately choose the beheading to show some mercy for Jane. And what's interesting is sources basically show that Mary didn't really want to kill Jane. And we tend to really kind of stomp on Mary's reign a lot due to the Protestant burnings. And obviously that's inexcusable. That is not anything that I'm saying should be swept under the rug. But we automatically assume because of that that she would want Jane to be killed. We assume that she would want that threat absolutely eliminated. But I think Think she recognized how much pressure would, was being put on Jane and all the forces around her that were trying to take care of this situation and take control. And I think she really wanted to give Jane the benefit of the doubt and keep her imprisoned where she could survey her, but also let her live in the meantime. However, this would ultimately have to change. So that begs the question, what made Mary change her mind and decide to kill Jane Grey? 
So Mary, now that she was queen, began her search of finding a suitable husband. When she took the throne, she was in her mid to late 30s. She would be approaching the end of her childbearing years soon, so it was important for her to marry and produce an heir for her throne. And she chose Philip II of Spain because he held a great deal of power, and he was also a very devout Catholic, and he also had relations to Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. This caused actually a great deal of contention throughout England. People were either very fearful of the solidification of Catholicism in England, or they were really afraid of the notion that Spain might somehow gain control over England. For those reasons, people ultimately would come to disagree with the marriage, and it would really feed into Mary's unpopularity. And this is further proved by the group formed under Tom Wyatt the Younger to overthrow Mary. Tom Wyatt had a personal aversion to the Spanish because his father had witnessed firsthand some of the horrors of the Spanish Inquisition, and he told these stories to Tom Wyatt, and he therefore grew up with this distrust and aversion to Spain, and many, you know, were also afraid of Spain for similar reasons. And Jane's father also had happened to support the rebellion, and this rebellion was eventually crushed by Mary's forces, and the connection between the Grey family and the Wyatt rebellion would eventually force Mary's hand. It was just too likely that somebody would try to bring Jane back onto the throne, so she would have to execute Jane, and she had basically almost no other choice. Well, at least in Mary's eyes, she felt that she had no other choice. Many people would assume that that was too treacherous of a thing to do on Mary's part, and I do agree it is treacherous, but we also know that Mary has gone through a lot to gain power and stay on her throne, so she's not going to take a threat like this lying down. So come February 1554, Jane and Guilford were sentenced to die on the 9th of February, but the date was eventually delayed to the 12th as Mary offered Jane a chance to convert to Catholicism to save her soul. This was kind of Mary's last rope to Jane that even even though she couldn't physically save her, she could still save her spiritually. Obviously, with Jane's devotion to Protestantism, she, she wouldn't end up converting over, but Mary had sent Jane her own personal chaplain, who ended up befriending Jane, and she eventually became comfortable enough with him that she asked if he would accompany her at her execution, and he agreed to do this so she could have a friendly face there at the end. And her husband was executed just before she was, and it was said that from her window she could see her husband's body and she said quietly his name, Guilford oh Guilford. Obviously, this is such a harrowing sight for a young girl to see. We have to remember she's about 15 or 16 at this time. This is already so much for her to have to go through at this age, and it's awful to think that a woman just in the prime of her life is about to face the end of her life. After Guilford's death, she eventually goes and mounts the scaffold. She asserted in her final statement to the crowd before her that even though the actions that she had been caught up in were unlawful, she stated that she was innocent. She pled for her innocency. Usually we'd think that that can't really match up, but in a way, I think that also shows Jane's character and again shows that she didn't want something like this. She knew that... This would pose an obvious threat to Mary, but she knew that this would pose a threat to Mary, but I think her heart wasn't invested in being queen. I think if she had the chance, she would have gladly let Mary have the crown and rule if she could have. I don't think she had any desire to destroy Mary like the people around her did. And Jane eventually blindfolded herself at the scaffold, but struggled to find the block and had to be led to it. And there she said her final prayer, commending Jesus to accept her soul. And then she was beheaded. So obviously it's a tragic end to a very short but sad story. But Jane Grey is a figure that's really continued to fascinate people over the years. She might have actually been forgotten if it weren't for somewhat of a resuscitation of her character during the Victorian era, during this period where a lot of people were kind of fascinated with the macabre and were interested in portraying it. I think one of 
the most popular images we have of Jane Grey is the French painter's Paul Delaroche's painting of the execution of Lady Jane Grey. I think that that's the one that we associate the most. We see Jane in a white dress and blindfold being led to the chopping block. We see the executioner over off on the right and then some of Jane's ladies in waiting huddled in the corner in agony over in the left. And we see a gentleman in the middle helping Jane on her way down to the block. The style of this painting is ultimately very Victorian. It's not a contemporary painting. Little details of that can be seen by um, the details of Jane's clothing, particularly her stays. But it's really a good personification of the image that Jane has developed. We've really seen her as this martyr, and she was viewed as a Protestant martyr for centuries. And she was even featured in several editions of the Book of Martyrs by John Fox. This legend of her kind of continued to grow with portrayals of her in popular media. There are some young adult books about her now. Obviously, we have that movie with Helena Bonham Carter. You know, there are some inaccuracies, specifically when it comes to Jane and Guilford's relationship in that movie. But if you want to familiarize yourself with the story, I think that that's a great way to do it. But part of the reason why we kind of crowd around this image of her is because it's something that we want to do to fill in the mystery ourselves because we don't have a proven contemporary portrait of her from the time in which she lived. And there is a portrait that is known as the Streatham portrait that some people believe is her, but historian David Starkey is somewhat skeptical about it, and he said that we really don't have much of a reason to believe that it's Jane. He says that there's a likely chance that it probably isn't, but people are really quick to want to say that it is because they want this mystery to be filled in some way. We want to be able to kind of comfortably put a close on this story. We don't want Jane to be forgotten, and we want want to be able to ensure that in some way she is remembered, but at the very least we can take comfort in the fact that her rise in popular media, even if her image somewhat fluctuates from where it was truly in history, that people still have an interest in her and still want to hear her story. There is some question over whether or not her reign was actually legitimate because she wasn't ever truly crowned and it was for such a short period. But I know for me personally, I have no problem calling Lady Jane Grey Queen Jane Grey. All right, so that's it for this week. Thank you guys so much for listening. And I say this every time, but all the platforms are different. So if you enjoyed it and you want to show support, whether you like or subscribe or follow or comment or leave a review any of that I would greatly appreciate it really does help to boost the podcast and help us share our fun discussions with other people that might want to listen to them as well and don't forget to tune in next week when I talk about the forensic journey of the Romanov family this is Tea Time Thoughts and I'll talk to you next week